Um, yeah, uh, who am I? I? I work with Tony Thomas in the sort of Arab Spring. We were, um, I was somehow um, involved with all the things we did in Egypt and in Libya and Syria. And um, now, um, what we did was, well, yeah, we, we grew some attention on, 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 on uh, yeah, all the things going on in the in, 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 Sorry, in Egypt and, um, and in Syria. But um, yeah, what have we done exactly? Um, when Mubarak pulled the kill switch in Egypt, they had no more internet connection, except the phone line they were working on. And so we thought, hey, let's um, build up some modern dialogues and uh, let's fax the members to Egypt. And it worked out. So we, um, got about 300 lines, and they were used for about 80% of the time. Of course, they were slow, and when I was checking on the machine, I saw only one correct name, uh, my and I was like, what? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, people used them, and they sent out pictures from the square, and they were writing emails. So um, I got in contact after all the turmoil in, in, um, on the square, and he said that he was very Thankful that he could write his parents an email that he's fine, they don't need to worry because that helps very much in England at this time. Um, in, in Libya and Syria, we, we tried to circumvent the surveillance of the internet. There was still internet and it was working, but it was heavy surveillance. In, um, in uh, Libya, we failed doing it. There was really no chance for us to really, really help. But uh, in Syria, we just found out that it was Western technology surveilling the internet. It was Blue Code. Blue Code is a big vendor for network technologies, and they normally are not allowed to sell anything to Syria for the last years. But uh, somehow the hardware made its way to Syria, and um, we revealed about five or seven gigabyte of blocks where we could see that anything is wiretapped. So every internet connection was wiretapped, and even the so-called secure internet connections were wiretapped, because Google has a system to crash HTTPS connections, so it's not secure anymore. And uh, it's the same hardware companies use to maintain the networks. For example, Deutsche Bank, they use it for their company network. They use it that people cannot bring out any internal information to the bank, for example. So the Deutsche Bank is surveilling their own employees with the same technology as Syria is surveilling the people. Um, one I heard is good, that the Deutsche Bank is doing this. <laughs> I heard that from media, for example. On the other hand, it's very bad. So the same technology is used to good and bad things. Or you can use it to uh, maintain the network to, uh, for example, every time a new iOS is coming out, the traffic is going up. You all know that. Um, the Deutsche Bank uses it to store local a copy of this new iOS and then distribute to the network that don't need to be downloaded all the time, for example. So, um, what did, what did we do? We, we found out, okay, it's this, um, this hardware and it's a way people. And then we built tunnels around it that people still can upload pictures, videos, blogs, write in, in Facebook groups or whatever. And they did. So many pictures you have seen in the, in the news from, from Syria went through our system. Um, what we did was that we took the videos and removed all metadata, geolocations, names, whatever. The metadata are full of the videos. So the videos were like place, time, person, who used the camera, everything. And we just removed it and then spread it on YouTube and anywhere else we could uh, do it. So, um, and then we, yeah. We were talking to the media, of course. We, we uh, made contact with people on the ground. We let, let them make interviews with people on the ground. Uh, we wrote about it. Uh, we have 
some documentations about what we have done, of course, with focus on the people on the ground. And um, we really have to spread attention on what's going on in Syria. And it was before it was this civil war as now. When we did, it was still an uprising. Um, then I for myself quit doing this because um, it didn't work out for me anymore. But I learned many things from that. And one thing is that we did work for things. Um, when we go back to Egypt, there was a decision of the government to shut down the internet. This was a decision by the state, at least, to do it. And we decided, as outsiders, no, that's not okay. In fact, we said what the government is doing there is not okay, and we claim the right to intervene as persons to do that. If the state had done this, certainly there were much diplomatic turmoil. But we as an activist group just, we just did it. And we had the luck to sit in Europe, most of us. It was okay. I, my, in Germany, Chancellor Merkel just said that Facebook or Twitter or anything else cannot be censored anymore in these countries. It is a little bit us who did it. She said, said this on the uh, Munich Security Conference. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is what she said. And um, the same thing in, in, in Libya, uh, uh, in Syria, they decide to surveil their people, which is, of course, not a good decision to do this. <laughs> um, and when we intervene, it was like from everywhere, hey, it's good that you do that. But in fact, if you go to the NATO doctrine, the Red Man for example, and this had happened to, uh, for example, if now activists from North Africa would do this in Germany to uh, help us not get away from the NATO doctrine, the Red Europe, it would be an act of cyber war. It would allow to go with troops into this country. So, yeah, it's world politics. What we missed all the time with while we did our actions uh, on the ground in North Africa was that we did not work political art. We started this too late. Too late. It was we worked, worked for over a year there before we started to work to write political papers on it to show the problems of uh, interior politics and exterior politics with activist groups, and we're still not done with that. We do, we do not talk about how far can a state go deciding how to use their internet infrastructure? And who should be in charge to do this? Uh, if you look at different countries, you have different organizations. Some are only private, some are uh, come from people, some are owned by the state. Which one is the correct one? Which one would be the best effort for the two people? We do not talk about this, and we need to talk about this, not only for our own countries, but for all countries. We need to think about uh, all the institutions who are giving out IP numbers or domain names. Is this okay what they do? I have seen domains which are switched away because the Egyptian authority said they need this domain. Hmm. No good idea. This just breaks up the net. We have so much or so many self-control mechanisms on, in all the internet infrastructure, but if the state intervenes, all these mechanisms don't work anymore. So, yeah, the DNS system, in fact, is centralized. If you want or not, it is centralized. We need to face that. Uh, the IP system is centralized in a way, too. Okay, it's three or four different organizations, but at least it's centralized on these organizations. We need to discuss about this. And we need to think about ways how we can reform it. And we just don't do it. We, just, we only work on the current problem, someone is surveying the net, someone is putting it off, or whatever. We do not discuss the future. We, at the moment, we give the future to the politicians. Do we really want that? Do we really want to give the future of the internet to some old people not understanding that we live in the internet? 
with the internet. That it's not only virtual, but it's real. We even missed this task that there is no virtual life at the internet. If I talk to someone on the ground, the person is there and it's happening to this person. It's not virtual if this person is killed. This is very real. And um, then you, we still talk about new media when we talk about the internet. <laughs> new media, well, as new as, I don't know, short message service? Or, or what? I, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. So we go as activists to, on the ground, help people, write software, educate people, but we do not change the structure behind it. Why we need to do that? Uh, in fact, I could have done better things than helping people on the ground, except, for example, uh, eating ice cream. Would be much more nice and, um, yeah. But we have no chance. And then, on the other hand, there are so many brilliant minds thinking about the internet and helping people, or thinking about how to help people, where at least it's only a handful or two handful who are really doing the work. So it's all about power structures. We need to think about this. We need to not only think about decentralized systems, but decentralized power. We do not really talk about decentralized power in different groups, for example. Um, when I was more or less spokesperson of telecomics, I could have said anything and have been a statement of telecomics. So I have great responsibility on the whole topic. And most groups work like this, and this is not okay, because it doesn't work. You work in small groups, but the very first day you have a problem with another person in the group, everything is breaking down. And if you have, if you do work which affects people in the crisis, you're not allowed to break down. You have no chance to break down. And we need to talk about this too. How can we move responsibility from one group to another, for example? Um, uh, we tried that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the first thing we got was, oh, how you do it, it's bad, we, we should do it in another way. And I was like, yeah, that's it. Let's go, let's go to the Syrians and tell them, sorry, what we did all the time was wrong, let's do it in another way, because the other guys don't want to use this software, because there's one line of code which they all like. It's, well, we are sometimes too proud to say, okay, this work, way is working and we can continue working on this way because we want to do everything completely 100% right. Which never works. We cannot be 100% right. And, uh, there will always be a better solution for everything. We have to taste that. But we do not search for solutions for the future of the internet. Why not? Um, we're sitting in conferences and talking about the actual problems we have. And we're sitting, we're sitting in many conferences the whole year and talking to people and all say, yeah, we need to think about that. <laughs> uh, I do not exclude myself from that. So, um, but, well, I'm sitting at home and writing papers on the conference. Well, not and then we leave the future to Google, Apple, and all the other companies, and Facebook, and we don't want that. But we just do it. We leave the future to those who want to make money with the internet, who do not see the potential of free culture, of collaboration, and just of communication with people you will never meet because you cannot afford to travel there. This is not how I thought about the internet when I started working here. For me, it was like, whoa, there are people in like, never heard of the city, but they're quite cool, and let's talk to them. And yeah, it is world politics to think about the future of the internet. It will be world politics to think about the new decentralization of systems. And it is world politics to 
to circumvent surveillance in one single place <coughs> and to communicate it. Another problem is that groups who help people on the ground or states where they are surveilled, they do not communicate. They do not show the problem to, to work to the world. They, they do not say, okay, we have this problem here and it can happen anywhere. Two years ago, I said to, to a newspaper, the software and hardware used in Syria, we use it in the Western Hemisphere too, and it is the same software we need to think about if we really want that. And it can be used as well us too. Only because we live in a democracy, it doesn't help us not to get to swear well, I got right, as you know now. It's, um, the wiretapping is going on, and um, yeah, at least in Syria, it was the intelligence service too who was wiretapping. That's the way. Like we have all over the world, as we know now, it's the intelligence service. And so it's world politics to think about an internet which cannot be surveilled, or hardly surveilled, or where you can choose which part you want to use. The, the basic idea of the internet routing the, the direct way, and, and well, it doesn't work anymore. We already have shadow internets with Tor, with I2P, and it's not usable to most people. I'm, I, I'm using, I love IGP, I'm using it quite often. Uh, if I tell friends of mine I'm using IGP, and I tell them what to do <laughs> to use it, so I say, okay, I, I, I fail, I, I want to be so away. And this is not an option. So, I, I, I know many programmers outside who are doing crypto things, and I talk to them and say, hey, Quite nice crypto, but it's not usable to many people. And they say, they should learn. <laughs> <laughs> Read the fucking manual. Yeah, yes. <laughs> That's true. Um, we had this earlier uh, in the first lecture um, building elites. We are an elite. I, for myself, can communicate in a very secure way. Well, well, in here, more I think now <laughs> the things I learned, but um, I most time know what I do, and I know what the computer is doing. But my dad, he's not. My my friends living with me in the same flat, they don't know what what is happening inside of the computer. They don't know what the possibilities, and if I would say to them, read the fucking manual, they would kick me out of the, of the apartment. So, um, we, we, we now just make sessions every uh, every week, one session, where I explain them what is happening with their computer. Of course, it's boring for me, but not for them. And they tell other people what's going on, and suddenly they, can, they come up with ideas how to work political on this issue, because they are not programming nerds. They are not grown up with internet and computers. But they have ideas, and they have new ideas, and they have good ideas. Um, then they come to me and ask, hey, how can we organize? At the moment, we have a Facebook group. And they're like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was searching for a group, <coughs> and I installed some for them, and I was like, okay, use a Facebook group. <laughs> just doesn't work. <laughs> so all the free software outside for collaboration in groups and the most, the most software cover one item. At least we need five different softwares to cover all the things Facebook groups can do. And this is not how people work. And I was, well, too lazy to combine them. So, what can we do? I have um, on my sheet of paper. I have um, there are two points that we can do. One thing is education, talk with programmers and show them why it's important that software is usable for ordinary people who are not into technology that much. Make it like this, yeah. And we have to talk to the, and they have to talk to designers. To people who know UIs. 
I, I could do a two hour run about UIs, about every UI, by the way. Uh, I will not do that today. Um, this is one point we have to do. And the other point is that we have to talk about the cyber war myth. There is no thing like cyber war. There's a great paper from uh, Kyra on Kyra.net. You will find her in master videos on cyber war. Why there is nothing like cyber war. Because uh, the big world politics use this term as an excuse to survey the internet, to uh, make hackers something like enemies of the state. And there's an attempt to make hackers, uh, God, I'm searching for the English word, uh, regular combatants mm -hmm. in a conflict. And we don't want that. I, I'm not wearing a uniform. I do not, I'm not a regular combatant on any side for a state because I don't believe in states. So I cannot be a regular combatant. But they tried to make us that. And then they will apply the rules of war and they are hard and they are bad. And there's another point. Uh, if they put their atomic uh, power plants on, with access to the internet, what? the problem is not that there are people hacking it, the problem is that it's on the internet. You know surgery on the internet? Huh? Have you heard about surgery on the internet? Yeah, <laughs> surgery over the internet. Yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> are they serious? Uh, and, uh, I mean, we have about three crashes of the, um, um, I'm visiting the for two, um, of the stock exchange in New York every week, only for microseconds, and then the software is rebuilding it. But we have three crashes every week because there are some commands coming in which let the thing crash. And it's not because people on the market are doing shit. But people sending orders which are not existing. I, I talked to, to, to one who's programming the system, and he's like, oh my god, what are we doing here? Uh, because we rely on the internet in a way which it's not built for. And we need to discover this too. And this is work politics. And we all should do more work politics. We should not only write in our blogs or Twitter about it, but really go and talk to people. It's not only face to face like, uh, hey, let's have a nice meal and talk about internet, but have lectures. Organize lectures. It's not that hard. You don't need to make a conference like this, but just make a, make a nice evening in, 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 in a small room with 50 or 30 people and tell them about internet. And what are the problems and what are the problems with world politics and what, why we are all messed and it's not that hard. But for that we need good narratives that people understand. If I would now have this talk uh, for my friends, they would be like, what? Because they don't speak this language. So we need. You will write test later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we need to, to find the narratives which all people can understand, or most people. Not about uh, a concept of freedom, but giving a story about freedom. Not only be about the concept of net neutrality, but telling stories about net neutrality. And then, I'm, I'm really sure, we can reach more people and more people will work in these fields or think in these fields and will write about it. I have talked to, um, to, to some journalists which are never ever had been in technology because they write for a small newspaper. And after this, they wrote an, an article for, for their local newspaper. And I was like, oh my god, I want this in a big newspaper, please. It's, it, it's even not online, but this is another story. And they wrote two pages in the newspaper about the future of the internet. And they wrote about how it is today and what it should be in words 
their readers can understand. And this is what we need. We need the stories of the internet people understand. And this <coughs> is local action combined with world politics. And now your questions, please. So can you just like tell us what to do? Is there no program or you know software? I'm not paying attention to the talk. <laughs> so you will repeat class. <laughs> no, uh, any, any questions or, or recommendations or if not we have well much time left. Okay. <clears throat> it's a true what you what you tell. Because we are this project, and I started to tell about the internet is not infinite, is not granted to be there, and people said, oh, that, that can't be true. And, and as you say, they don't want to listen to it either. So we kind of try to get in to have a small talk presenting the project and telling a little about the future of the internet is not granted. People say, ah, oh. and those are academics, they are people with uh, some power, and some political power, so we really, it's so true what you say, and I can <coughs> just support it, but everybody goes around and, and tells those nice little stories in, in a very simple language. Because all school children here are kind of conditioned and what uh, you uh, told about uh, this habitual thing, you are in the habit of, okay, internet is there. It's not true what you say. And all those uh, devices that can only be used if you are internet connected. And um, yeah, many people still don't get that all the fancy thing on their smartphones is coming through the internet. <laughs> They think it's so they have servers and now they have internet and that everything is working. But that it's different protocols and different things working in the smartphone. <coughs> many people don't know. They know they don't they need a data plan, but they don't really know why and that's it. And when they enter somebody's home before taking off the coat, they say, Oh, what's your password for Wi-Fi? Yeah. Give your trumpet for it. <laughs> no, it still works. You can give trumpet or, or password, and seventy percent of the people give you a password for trumpet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think because I talked about this, what you mentioned, uh, this uh, lack of communication between the products made by this specific scene and uh, actually the, the potential user, and what is in between this human designer or whatever that knows about user interface that it doesn't exist. And I think it has a lot of connection with the, the problem that there is no women on the scene. I think it comes with, it's not the, it's not the same type of problem, but the, uh, the type of uh, uh, arrogance and the unselfish. Kind of <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the same. It's the arrogance it's of, of, of the, the male community to talk to non-technicians yeah, and, and, and not, not to be able to be open to, to the rest of the people or the, to include the other segment of making the program final. You cannot say that it's done when nobody can use it yeah. <laughs> or the yeah, majority I, of I the have, people. I so I think we should fix it. This topic uh, two years ago at the communication conference with the group together and it was like, people, please talk to designers. Please listen to them. They are right. They know what they do. Because they are designers and you are not. And if they can do UI interfaces, uh, UIs, then please listen to them. Because they know what to do. And if everyone could design a user interface, there would be the job of UI design. <laughs> so, uh, but many nerds and hackers are yeah, too arrogant to listen to other people because no, I don't agree with that. I, I totally disagree with you. Oh, it is the, it's I, a lack of resources. No, but no, it's the lack of resources. No, 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 no. I don't have enough time to actually do good user interface. The user interface can be developed later on. 
sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But it's never done. Well, let's do it. In, in, in which Give me a user are. interface designer who does a user interface for the tools that I design. Okay. But they have there, there's a, there's a GitHub, you can take it, you can fork it, you can tack on a user interface on that. No one is ever doing that. So, so you're but saying that the design is something that you want to run behind your back and, 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 uh, and patch whatever you have done into something that they are working. I think if you're doing a second class, what is like your software? If you have a library and you have a, a bottom up uh, user interface hierarchy, like you have a library where you can program and you can interface to it with any kind of user interface that you want to do. You have a lower level command line interface, you have an end interface, you have a web interface, you can have, you can tack on all kinds of interfaces with good library design. But this is, this means, but this is, you need to, that is, is need to be correct for that. There's an interaction, a dual a dialogue. Between yeah. there needs to be a dialogue between coders and designers. You cannot just say, "Well, let me just fix it up after I've done my glamorous work." They can just come in and they can say, "Clap." But I'm talking about crypto. These protocols are Sorry, guys. Hello. Hello. Please ask your question. Yeah. 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 Encapsulate all the goings on behind and sort of hide stuff because I like working in plain text because that's what I see in front of me, but that's not very useful to many people. I mean, like Emacs Oracle, I love it, but I can't send it to people who expect a, a text pro a word processor document. So uh, if you can bridge that gap, that would be nice. I think that's something to do. So, so in middle ground in, in the discussion. <laughs> Yeah, you need to build that app and you can do it with uh, one way education, of course, which is the long and hard way education. Or I had a tool seen a few months ago and I was like, oh, it's stating what is happening in, inside of the machine. Mm -hmm. So the tool was telling me what it is doing, which protocol it is using, and everything. Of course, this was hard to implement for, 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 for the code. But I was like, whoa. And uh, I did a proper code review, that, so it was, in fact, true what it was, it was stating. This is not true, but now people believe it, uh, uh, intend to believe what is on the screen, unfortunately, which is one of the problems, by the way. They, they believe their machine. Mm -hmm. So um, there's the education point, so do not believe your machine. But uh, of course, you always have to, to die one there. So uh, on the one hand, you can make it nice and cozy, usable for most people, but then you have to live with that something might go wrong, but which is going, in fact, that more work, people are working with tools you created, and which might help them. On the other hand, uh, if you like play text, then uh, which they can review your output and everything else, um, you need to know very many things to because if I would show my dev log file it's a nice text. And that's the point. I will never educate him on a level that he understands this is log for example. I think you need to make the text better. Yeah, yeah language and, text and uh, literature. Um, <coughs> Yeah, but if you start with designing something from the user understand. interface, you are stuck with the user interface. If you have like a flexible infrastructure below, you can adapt and create more user interfaces and that are actually catering to all the different needs that we have and not the one that you think that might be very valid in some setting, in some social setting, but there's, there's a lot of, of uh, diverse needs in user interfaces. And if you start with, as you say, we have a dialogue and there's this protocol and we need this user interface and these tools are tied together, then there's no chance to create these, all these kinds of diverse interfaces that you need for your tool. We need a diverse uh, interfaces for our tools, actually, because the different use cases and different roles and different people using that 
So, and, and some of these tools that, like, like when we're talking about crypto, this is extremely precisely defined protocols by mathematicians. And if we fuck up just one order of, of, of things, then the whole protocol is forced. And it doesn't matter how nice the user interface is because under, the underlying stuff is broken. Well, my point is that we need, we need manuals, so we need communication so that everybody can understand. So you have to make this manual for dummies. Not the funky manual, but the lovely manual that's so much fun to read and, <laughs> and on the drive. The most interesting thing is that the, the answer is beyond both points. You can't publish a library and say, here, make my user interface, and the other one can't say, please, teach me all the day long. You have to find something between. Yeah. Uh, for the Pyrocox project, it took one and a half year to find somebody who can do the front-end work on HTML and HTML5, but because I have no time to learn it to make a user interface. So it's an, a specific point. People come around and say, I want to do this. Okay, I start the teaching them, start to help them to install the software, try to figure out. And it's, a, it's an evolving process with the, with the designer. So the designer has to have the, uh, the current, has to have an idea what's going on, and he has to learn, and he wants to learn what's going on beyond, and on the other way around, you as a, as a programmer, you have to teach the designer how to use your stuff. It's something like the mentorship yesterday on the on the uh, keynote. Help the people, help themselves, help the people, and educate the people as a programmer, and, and the other way around, the designer had to learn something beyond two. So we have to come together. But at, at least the programmer has to learn that designers know what they do, and maybe that they might be right on yeah. design decisions. Yeah. So um, then I had here, and then you. Well, besides the code we're discussing with the designer, the problem seemed to be that when you develop a product, uh, nobody talks to the end user, basically. Especially in a the company, they come with a new product, and the, the people sitting there is frustrated because I mean, there's like uh, a book in Sweden called The Fucking Shit System, the Jävla Shit System, and it's uh, a shit system. Anyway, shit system, it doesn't matter. The, the, the whole point is frustration that end users comes up with because uh, nobody told them, nobody made an educational discussion with them about the new system, what it would mean, what uh, how to use it, and in the end run, it's ineffective. So that's the main problem, in my opinion. Uh, there's another discussion here that needs to work, yes, but this is the end problem. I think we've noticed in, in commercial companies over the last 10 years a trend that we have more and more front-end coders and back-end coders. So what we need is more front-end coders in open source to people who, who have, can do visual design but can also do interactive stuff. That means that they must code at least a little bit of JavaScript. So if you are a, are a coder, you either learn a little bit of design, or if you're design, you need to learn a little bit of, for example, HTML5 and JavaScript. So that you, it's not enough to design just the visual look. You need to also do a little bit of coding to hook up to the library. The choice of using a browser for your user interface is a very economic choice, because you do not want, but you do not have the resources for developing for all the kind of platforms that you want to support. But anyway, I mean front end designers, front end coders is what we need. So you then, you then you. So um, yesterday, Johannes mentioned uh, William Gibson's Neuromancer, uh, and you know, kind of like the, the generations of evolution of thought about networks, and cyberspace, and whatever. Neuromancer. Some thought it was a dystopia. Some thought it was a utopia. Um, you know, I grew up uh, in the 70s and 80s. During the 90s, I had a, a career as a network intelligence engineer uh, up, to, up to high level. And I look at some of the problems that we face today, and you know, yes, there's like huge disconnects, um, not only in things like between uh, you know people doing low level libraries and people who are you know generally tasked to bring the uh, accessibility to the to the mass audience, but also I think a lot of us have a problem communicating. Uh, from, we have a lot of trouble communicating actually what the problem is. Um, because here we are uh, pointing to things like decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer and 
you know, blah, 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 and people, you know, without the background or grounding and, you know, some depth of this stuff, uh, they don't have the context to understand us if we're, if we're primarily tech. So I'm talking about myself here as, as a problem with my own communication. Um, tie this together with the network itself, the infrastructure, uh, is very hierarchical. Um, it's, it's simply, uh, you know, an optimal economic solution to have hub and spoke networks um, that are uh, basically tend towards natural monopolies uh, in economic terms, so long as we've got scarce uh, real estate for fiber paths and things like this. But whereas we're trying to overlay uh, a centralized peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, structure on this old hierarchical uh, system, and we see where it's going. And, you know, and nowadays, you know, you just walk around on the street and like you said, they've got no idea what's going on behind the the street. They've got no idea that there's a problem. How do you react to that? I'm curious. Uh, about the least, at the moment, I'm, I'm telling people what is going on, what is happening at the moment, how does everything work, and for example, there, there is the right structure, that there are period companies making money with it, that the, the, the sea cables are owned by a company making money of it, and uh, if the, someone has to pay for this shit, that it's not for free, that it's not granted, and that if we want to have it, then we need to think how to pay it, and if there are other ways to pay it, for example. So, you know, back to the future. How could we manage the future to have an internet which is there and working, and the most free is to have better. And how can we achieve it? And this is what I'm working on, or I'm well, thinking about at the moment, and talking to people, and um, yeah. But yes, we need to communicate what is going on. And uh, I, I still know people who are well living on the internet who don't know about tier one, two, and three providers, which are working in the background. Hmm. And even if you look up in Wikipedia, there's a sponsor box that they ask me about that. So, um, yeah, we need to, to educate and communicate and talk to people. And, we, and talk in a language they understand. This is very important. I can talk here in another language than I can talk uh, in my office, for example. Because I can use what I don't understand. So now, uh, I think, sorry. Yeah. So uh, I was uh, at this journalist conference in France on Thursday where the, the people were trying to deal with the, the issue that uh, hackers are increasingly doing the job of journalists and, uh, and these two groups need to work together. And I suggested that maybe uh, every journalist should have a hacker surgically attached to them by the hip. Um, <laughs> now, I was only half joking. And I'm only half joking now when I suggest that, you know, as to Otto's point, uh, maybe what needs to happen is that every hacker should have a designer surgically attached to the hip. Now, this is becoming a bit like the human centipede, but the idea is that um, every, uh, you know, every person who's working in the space, especially people who are very, very deeply nested in the uh, back end development, the low level protocol stuff, really need to have a, uh, a counterpart who uh, is attached to them in such a way that they do not leave each other until the, the problem is solved or there has been complete skill transfer in both directions so that both can equal handedly or even handedly do the job of the other. Uh, because, you know, I, I've, Steph and I argued uh, for a good hour yesterday about uh, what, you know, essentially the same question. How do we make things, the, the cool, awesome things that Steph is working on, usable for the next couple of billion people? And right now, you know, nobody has an answer for that, and everybody realizes, I think. I do. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't give that my answer. No, please. Please. Uh, no, uh, no, no. Uh, 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 people are recognizing that there's a problem, but we haven't figured out how to fix it. And until we fix it, caring is probably the best solution we have. Yeah. Ah, this is what Willow and me said two years ago. Yeah. Team up with the designers. Uh, actually, I think this she was first, then yeah. she. Just a quick comment. This is actually what the women's outreach program is doing in GNOME. They have mentors and women, so 
and be different <laughs> solution. Team up with somebody who has the like, opposite. No, not, not mentors and, and learners, peers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I would, I mean, I, I agree with you, but I think that we need to, to look at our circles as well. And we all work in silos a bit. I mean, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the reality today. And there are no real connections between them. And I mean, to, to answer your overarching the questions, uh, world politics, and how do we look to the future of the internet? Thank <laughs> you. 